afternoon and uh, welcome to our webinar, The Future of Spanish Wines. I'm Andrew Catchpole, editor of Harper's Wine and Spirit, and today's session is uh, in association with foods and wines from Spain. Okay, the future of Spanish wines. Um, if you could have missed the evolution, uh, perhaps revolution isn't too strong a word in Spanish winemaking these past years and decades. And today we're going to focus on some of those innovative winemakers and the direction they're pushing the industry in. We have five exemplary uh, producers with us, one's along in just a moment, I'm just running a little late, um, who will present five unique directions in which the Spanish winemaking scene is evolving and innovating. Allow them to introduce themselves in a little while, um, as they're going to give a snapshot of what they're up to before we go into a more general discussion. But also joining them on the panel, we have two prominent members of the UK trade, Paul Shinney of um, Importer and Agent um, Alliance Wine, and Hannah Wilkins of the fantastic independent merchant Vineyards of Sherburn, who will join us in that discussion as we all share our perspectives um, and discuss the key trends set to shape the Spanish wine industry over the next five to 10 years. We'll also endeavor to answer questions from the panel, um, sorry, from the audience or, or the panel, um, either during the discussion period or, um, or towards the end of the session as time allows. So um, do use your Q&A function to interact with the panel. That would be great. So uh, it's probably enough for me. And um, I'd like to begin with uh, Richard, Richard Grant of Arix UK. Um, who in a sense is talking, his his topic header was tradition, but in a sense it's modernity that's rooted in tradition. Well, perhaps it's better, Richard, if I allow you to explain where you're, where you're coming from. So, Richard, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you to the rest of the members of this panel and this webinar. Um, let me say just a couple of things about RAX first. Many of you know the company. It was founded by Javier Galareta 30 years ago now, so quite visionary in its day. And it's an export consortium that has 15 family wineries, independent family wineries from 11 regions of Spain selling in export uh, premium Spanish wine. In terms of the UK, where we are keen to develop business, um, last year was a good year. We grew by nearly 90%. We reached 1.2 million euros, and most proudly, we achieved an average excellence price of five euros a bottle. And I think this is, okay, we're not the biggest importer and supplier to the exporter and importer into the UK, but I think we are one of the ones who's at least trying to take um, Spanish wine in the direction that we'd all like it to do, and that is to sell more at a higher price, um, simplifying it enormously. And so, on to the topic. And when this came up, Andrew asked us to talk about the future of Spanish wine. I immediately thought of climate change and old vine. And it's not a sort of cheap trick to bring climate change into the Spanish territory, but quite the opposite, really. And that is that why doesn't Spain make more of its extraordinary history? historic vineyards that it has. And of course, people are doing this step by step. But to put it a little in perspective, I'm, what, what is climate change in Spanish vineyards? Well, most of us, even, even from the Basque country, right down to Jerez, um, and we have wineries in, in both those places and, and all the way between, what we're seeing really is rising temperatures, for longer, which is important. So it's not just that you get 40 degrees during the summer. You're now getting 35 degrees in April. So it's this extraordinary rise in temperatures for longer. And then when it comes to water, which is the other thing we're seeing, we're seeing near drought conditions in some places. And again, if you look at just the totals, that can be confusing because it's the spread as we all know all of us in the trade and in the business producers and trade alike understand that it's not about total rainfall it's about the distribution of rainfall in the periods of the growing cycle simplifying that you could suddenly have a downpour in october it would be a disaster of course it would compute into the total rainfall numbers but really wouldn't compute into the vines growing cycle or into its health etc etc 
that's on the sort of that's my rough definition of of climate change when it comes to Spanish vineyards. Um, if we talk about old vine, um, I'm I'm trying to keep this as 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 tight as possible. Yeah, old vine in most regions is 35 years and above. Um, although, for most of us, and that's then that's a legal definition. For most of us, it's 45 to 100 years is what is absolutely crucial. Um, Spain has, as we know, the largest vineyard under vine in the world. I don't know, and I should have researched it, but maybe one of the excellent people like um, the lady, um, what's her first name, Paul Abbott. Um, well, well, Paul's not there. Um, Sue, it's Sue Abbott, is it? The Sarah, 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 Sarah Abbott. Sarah, Sarah Abbott, okay, maybe yeah. Sarah Abbott, when we when next meet with her, can, and can maybe drill down on that. I suspect Spain has the most old vine, 35 years and above, under vine in the world as well. So there's this extraordinary opportunity that comes from a threat. Um, as we all know, many of the, the best things do actually come from adversity, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. To give it a bit more detail, at COP27, um, as you know, celebrated in Egypt last year, 16th to the 18th of November, an important paper was presented by a man called Pablo Carbonell. I don't know if any of you know about this, but anyhow, he presented a paper that was sprung from the Rioja Vine and Wine Institute. And here he explained that through DNA genome comparisons of old and young vines, it was scientifically demonstrated that old vines through specific vegetal mutations and changes are better, better uh, adapted to climate change. And, and this is like a major thing. So Spain has really got out there, has, a, has attended the most important forum and has, has had documented evidence about this. And I think what we need to do, the trade and companies like ours, is to, to talk more and more about this. Um, of course, where do we see this? I, as you know, RAX, was, RAX originally was a Rioja Alavesa company. Um, over 10 years ago, Javier st stepped out of Rioja Alavesa. Now we have wines from Ribera, Navarra, Rueda, Toro, Priorat. Uh, Carver, Chacoli, Castilla, Vino de la Tierra de Castilla. Um, I think I've got all of them there, but the most important one, perhaps, it continues to be Rocco Alaves, and, and certainly in, in our position in the, in the UK, uh, where we have brands like Altos Rioja, Castillo La Bastida, Monte Buena, Altos de Baroja, Heredad de Baroja, Roland Garareta, Luis Cañas, Amarén. These are the wines that are doing incredibly well, and there are a few Rioja Alavesas that we still want to introduce, such as La de Paula, Manuel Quintano. Um, it's no coincidence also that Rioja Alavesa is doing so well. When you look at what's going on in the Rioja Alavesa vineyard, Rioja Alavesa vineyard is just 20% of the total planting. Again, I haven't got the specific proof of this, but I would say the average age is above 45 years. So already there is a comparison between consumer acceptance and demand at a higher price for these wonderfully balanced wines that are being made in the Rioja Alavesa, where old vine fruit, high altitude, Atlantic climate, et cetera, et cetera, all play in. And where, where this thing about climate change is, is on everyone's agenda. Um, coming back to the scientific document presented in, in COP, um, the way the old vines are adapting to these severe conditions are, are really interesting. And this is happening, Rioja Alavesa, Castilla-La Mancha, which, although it's a huge area, has a huge amount of old vine. And so potentially um, and commercially an extraordinary opportunity for Spain. Toro, Rueda, even in whites. We'll talk a little bit about whites as well. Ribera del Duero, Navarra, Priorat. What's happening in all these regions that are chock a block of old vine, as I suspect the country is chock a block, is, is, is really interesting. So the old vine is traditionally autochthonous grapes, is the first thing. Why is that? It's because to be uh, defined as old vine, you're 45 years ago or 35 if you want. In those days, there wasn't so much um, plantings of, of the new foreign varietals. So it was autochthonous varietals planted on dry land. Why dry land? Vines do better on dry land, as we know, better. Okay, the quality is better. In the old days, there was less production pressure 
to make masses of kilos and masses of liters per hectare. So what we see in these old vines, in all these traditional regions I'm talking about, is that the, the vines on dry soils, these old vines have developed really serious roots. Okay, it's basic, but uh, in dry land, you get wonderful old roots, these old roots and the old vine. Um, we're talking here about Tempranillo, Garnacha, Cariñena, Mafuelo, Graciano, Benedicto, the mother of Tempranillo, Garo, Maturano, Cadrete, all of these really interesting uh, autochthonous grapes. And in the whites, um, Fiura, Malvasia, Rojal, Tempranillo Blanco, the very best Verdejo, the Verdejo from old vines planted around La Seca and Serrada. Um, foreign varieties, less interesting perhaps at this stage, although, and, and there's never anything black and white in the wine business, as we all know, um, although some of the most pioneering plantations of non-Spanish grapes were 35, 40 years ago. And within the RAX portfolio, we've got two places in particular whose vines are now into 40 years, and they are our single vineyard DOP, um, sorry, a single denomination of origin, um, Pago de Thirsus in Navarra, where we have 40-year-old Syrah, Merlot, and Cabernet, where the same, let's say, mutations of DNA are happening through the old vine that the, the, the paper presented at COP can demonstrate. And also with Chardonnay, both in this uh, really interesting property, Pago de Thirsus, and also in Castilla-La Mancha, and, and an excellent producer that's re represented in, in the UK by the Wine Society, um, and Munoz, and their Finca Munoz. They make an absolutely spectacular old vine Chardonnay from 40-year-old Chardonnay. Um, let me continue with the argument. Another point, a mutation that plays into the hands of quality from old vine is, is of course, the rootstock itself, the, the vine, yes? So the, the older the vine, the thicker the vine in very basic terms. And the thickness of the vine, be it a wonderful old vine, Rioja Alavesa, or a wonderful Toro or a Priorat, the, the size plays into it. Um, so in moments of absolutely extreme heat and lack of water, the plant for photosynthesis and for production of ripe fruit pulls from the wood. And this is something that I've spoken to many of our winemakers and agronomists about. It's, it's fascinating. Of course, a young vine just cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Another point, interesting point. Um, the, there are some studies uh, demonstrating how they're at the vine, old vines, adapt physiological defense mechanisms. And I think we'll all have seen this happen as you get into extreme heat, lack of water, the vines in general, young vines go, go to complete shutdown, at which point photosynthesis stops. You can get really complicated fruit problems. And this happened in 2022 with young vines in, in different areas of Spain. Whereas the old vines, have, a, have developed over the years a more sophisticated physiological defense mechanism, slowing down vegetal growth, but not slowing down photosynthesis. So like really interesting, really interesting things emerging from this. Mm -hmm. So finally, um, finally in all of this, perhaps I'm going a bit too long, but I'm, I am passionate about all of this, apart from the, the corresponding correlation between this opportunity and a defense of the climate, which is at the heart of all of this, there's another point, And that is that to make a wonderful organic wine, better with old vine as well you know older the vine basically the smaller the production therefore the less treatments you need to give and then uh, yet again spain with its dry arid climate should be looking at old vines and organic as it's two absolutely key um, drivers moving forward and really that's about it um, i'm passionate about this i think we need to Spain in general needs to be looking to lead the way on topics. And I would like us to, particularly in the RAX properties where we are doing all of this, um, I'd love to lead the way in old vine and in organic and to make better wine more sustainable um, and ideally to, to raise the price. Yeah, well, which hopefully would would create a sort of yeah a virtuous circle. So very uh, some great points there, Richard. Um, so a very quick question um, 
for you. Um, how much potential is there for, for, for Spain to sort of further exploit its old vine heritage? Could you just give us like a really, really concise kind of idea for what resources are still out there that are perhaps still mm -hmm. not being underutilized by, by producers, by winemakers? Okay, so this is a huge topic and really interesting topic. Um, I'll, maybe I'll just go to Rioja Alavesa as the as the case in point, yeah. Um, and there's no sort of desire to leave Rioja or any of that going on, and just make the most of the virtues of of a specific subzone um, of of a region. We are we are very dependent on legislation. All producers, we're very we're very dependent on authorities and appellations recognizing what's good and what, what is unique in their own territories. And so in Rioja Alavesa, one of the things that has emerged recently is Viñedos Singulares. Lo and behold, Viñedos Singulares, the majority are in Rioja Alavesa. Lo and behold, you need to be at least 35 years old to have a, sing, uh, a Viñedo Singular. So from a, a legal and um, governmental regional um, perspective, appellation perspective, that there's where we need the help. We need the help. We need the help okay. for, yeah. for these yeah. unique points. Yeah, so it needs, yeah, okay. And well, then each, each, yeah. each winery, of course, each winery, I, we have a number of our wineries, well, all of them pay a premium price for old vine fruit. Perhaps the most exceptional in that way is, is Luis Canias and Amaren, but I don't want to pick out them because I've got my mm -hmm. other wineries such as Altos Rioja in in El Villar, um, alongside Lara de Paula mm -hmm. and, and my friends in, in La Bastida, they are, they're all doing the same. So mm -hmm. that this change is linked to the winemakers and the, the, the owners taking brave decisions. Of course, they need to believe that they can sell the wine and they'll sell the wine yeah. when the message yeah. about old vine equaling better quality, equaling um, better for the sustainability of the, of the, of the, of the whole world is, 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 is passed through that message. Message. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, my pleasure. So, um, let's move on. My next uh, sort of subheader is indigenous. And um, we have Victor, Victor Ordner of Bodega Jorge Ordner's, who's um, going to talk, uh, I believe, on innovating with indigenous grapes for authenticity and a sense of terroir or just terroir. Um, Victor, would you like to say a few words about, about you and your winery and um, launch into your, your piece? Hi there. Yes, of course. No, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you all today. Um, my name is Victor Ordonez, um, third generation of uh, the Ordonez family in the wine business here in Spain. Uh, we have several different kind of footholds in the Spanish wine industry. Um, we got involved uh, in the late 1950s when my grandfather started distributing La Rioja Alta around the city of Malaga in the south of Spain. So uh, we got our kind of start in the Spanish wine business as distributors in and around the city of Malaga and other beachside towns on the Costa del Sol selling to fine restaurants and, and hotels there. Um, the second generation was pioneered by Jorge, my dad, who um, eventually moved to the United States in 1987 and, and was basically single-handedly responsible for introducing Spanish wines in a major way to the United States. Um, and this was a, a, a presentation topic that I felt particularly excited and, and passionate about when, when you sent it to me, because mm -hmm. I think from the very beginning that the focus of, of the portfolio here in the U.S. has been on, on not only um, quality producers, but indigenous varieties. Um, and I think the third evolution in, in our family's business, which perhaps the most exciting one has been um, the kind of founding and, and, and creation of our family's own estate wineries. Um, and um, so today, um, Bodega Sordoniev is a group of, of, I don't know if I have screen sharing capabilities or even if that's of interest, but uh, I can show you a map where we produce, but a group of five uh, wineries uh, producing wine in six different DOs, um, all of which um, have an important focus on indigenous grape varieties. So why are we passionate about indigenous grape varieties? I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, Richard touched on a few important points. You know, Spain is is Earth's number one viticultural area in terms of area under vine. Um, third, in terms of uh, wine produced, depending on the vintage, depending on how much it rains, um, not least due to the old vines that we have and the dry climate. But we're certainly lagging behind. I think everyone knows this because article upon article is released about this on a weekly basis that the value of our wine sold is is one of the lowest on planet Earth. And I think that 
one of the issues that we've had from the beginning is that um, this obsession with selling wine in bulk, this obsession with with exporting and selling wines in the domestic Spanish market as well at very, very low price points. And I think while, you know, kind of my, my, my thesis statement, for lack of a better term, is that while I think, you know, international varieties might have potential in Spain, at least in the export market, at very, very low price points, I think that Spain's obvious need these days is to premiumize the wines that it's selling internationally. Um, you know, once again, Pat Richard on the back for his average 60 euro per case um, export price, because I think especially in a market, as far as I understand, like the UK with tremendous price pressure, that's a very strong achievement. So good on you. you. Um, but I think that, you know, Spain's obvious need is to premiumize. Spain's obvious need is to, is to differentiate especially compared to countries like France and Italy, where, you know, we share uh, borders with one and, and close borders with another, that um, while I think you could argue that we have a richer history in viticulture and fine winemaking going back almost 3,000 years than both of those countries, I think um, we're obviously uh, much younger than they are in the, in the export market. And I think, once again, it's been demonstrated that we are still light years away from them in terms of uh, the quality of our marketing, in terms of the marketing spend that we do in different export markets. And so I think indigenous varieties have to be important. I think, you know, you look at a grape variety like Garnacha, you know, which is a Spanish grape variety, um, although the French would probably argue differently, um, but it's a grape variety that is indigenous to Aragon, where six centuries ago, the grape variety was not known as Garnacha. It was known as the Tinta de Aragon, the red wine grape from Aragon. Um, when we started exporting wine or importing wine to the United States, Garnacha was not only Earth's or Spain's most widely planted red grape variety, but Earth's most widely planted grape variety over Cabernet. Um, and due to a variety of reasons, not least due to the pressure from the export market, this variety was ripped up and replanted with Tempranillo, but also other international red grape varieties across Spain, Cabernet, Syrah, Merlot, all among them. I think that sometimes internally in Spain, particularly with not with the producers on this call, uh, but particularly with larger, more bulk oriented producers, I think there's a misconception that the export market wants these varieties. Um, and once again, I think while this might be true in certain export markets and particularly almost at universally, almost universally at lower price points, I think that that at the premium price point is is not the case. Uh, point point cases is, is that, you know, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the last stat I saw is that 40% of all white wine sales in Spain with a DO, not Vino de la Tierra, not, not wine of Spain, <clears throat> IGP, 40% of all white wine sales with a DO in Spain are internationally Verdejo. So, you know, um, you don't, uh, the, the, the numbers achieved with, with varieties like Chardonnay or, or Sauvignon Blanc or, or other international varieties in Spain, you know, still um, kind of pale in comparison, speaking specifically about the U.S., um, Albariño is absolutely dominant in here, um, you know, and, and I think you only need to look at the 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 way that Rias Baixas has been managed with regard to not overplanting, focusing on a premium price point. Martin Codax, which is a large cooperative that produces 600,000 cases of wine a year, here in the U.S. sells for $13.99 a bottle on the shelf. So let's think about the fact that the largest, most volumetric, most mass-produced for lack of a better term, Albariño in the market is still selling here in the U.S. at $14 a bottle. Pretty good. Um, and I think, <clears throat> you know, at the end of the day, once again, talking about climate change, it, just, just to echo what Richard was saying, um, the only way that, I mean, I think Spain is in somewhat, in some ways fortunate enough that we're the second highest country in Europe in terms of average elevation behind Switzerland. So we do have some protection from climate change, particularly at higher altitudes and, 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 um, and new vineyard sites becoming available due to the due to climate change. But I also think that there's no way that we survive climate change without old vines. You know, you you, you take a even I mean, even we produce uh, wine in Toro, right? Um, <clears throat> Jorge was responsible for founding Numancia in 1998, which was the winery that put Toro on the world stage. And right now we have an estate in Toro called Bodegas Batan, where we work exclusively with ungrafted Prephylaxeric in some cases, and in some cases, the youngest vineyard we work with is planted in 1958, all dry farmed. Um, you only need to look at the root systems of these vines. We had in, our, in one of our oldest vineyards, a tractor accidentally hit an old vine and, and, and caught one of the arms of the old vine and ripped up the whole thing, and the root system was 20 feet below the surface. You only need to look at the ability of those vines to, to withstand extreme drought, um, weather variation, and compare that to you know a high density trellis that's <laughs> irrigated with drip irrigation 
um, to see, you know, where the future lies. And I think in summary, you know, before handing the baton off to someone else, you know, I think the one one case study in 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 focusing on indigenous varieties versus international varieties are, are two regions that we are both we are very passionate about and represent heavily here in our portfolio in the US is Rioja versus Navarra. You know, two Appalachians that um were heavily impacted and basically created in the modern age by uh winemakers from Bordeaux coming south during the phylloxera to fill their barrels and to fill their vats with wine because they had no wine because, you know, the phylloxera um, wiped out all of Bordeaux. Um, they arrived in both Navarra and, and Rioja, which are two appellations that, you know, in many cases have similar terroirs, are located right next door to each other. Uh, Bordelais winemakers showed both regions how to produce quality wine aged in barrel. One region, uh, Rioja, after the French left, focused and bet on indigenous varieties, for the most part, with a few notable accessions like you know, Baron de Chirel from Marquez de Riscal has always had a significant percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon in it. And one region like Navarra bet on international varieties and look at where the two regions are today. And I think Navarra, which not to disparage Navarra, it's a region that we're very passionate about, that we represent one of the top producers in the region here in the United States, um, but a region that I think had kind of a flash in the pan success with these, with these international varieties in the 20th century and since has in many ways languished and has had in a lot of cases to reinvent itself by showing the market that they're going back to focusing on varieties like Garnacha and Graciana. So I think it's almost inarguable that that international varieties from Spain are are the should be the focus. I think it's inarguable that the premium wine consumer, which is the one that Spain is really interested in or should be interested in, wants these wines. And you know, I, I'm I'm bullish about the fact that um, you know, Cab, Merlot, Syrah, Sauvignon Blanc, I mean Rioja authorized Sauvignon Blanc. Why? It's a total, you know, it's a total waste of time. I mean, the, the the white Rioja that is putting white Rioja back on the map is Tondonia, and that's never had that's never had Sauvignon Blanc in it. So I think I think that's certainly where we have to put our focus. And you know, I couldn't be more strongly opinionated about that. And I think probably most of the people on the call would would agree with that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I, I there's nothing wrong. We like um, strong opinions here, but I think the the Rioja Navarra um, contrast was is 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 a really interesting one to to bear in mind. Just a, a very very quick question springing from that. Um, sort of bring in um, one of the UK trade members. So, Paul uh, uh, Alliance, and obviously um, I'm sure many people out there in the audience, having had a look, uh, are aware of you know the sort of fantastic work you've been doing with Garnacha, for example, um, and so on. Um, but it, what's what's your sense? Um, what would you is this the case that that to, to premiumize for Spain to premiumize its 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 wines to sort of maximize, you know, its returns that it it, it could dig deeper into its indigenous varieties? And I'm also thinking to a certain extent that Garnacha and Tempranillo are obviously pretty well, you know, established in people's minds as Cabernet say is from 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 France um, or Syrah. But but beyond that as well, the sort of wealth of other indigenous varieties. Are, there, are these serious commercial propositions? I mean, obviously, Albarino has made its mark. That's a variety that pe wine interested people know. But then as we get beyond that as well, how 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 much mileage is there in Spain playing its indigenous cards? I mean, I think uh, I'll just spend a few days in Rioja. I met mm -hmm. with Richard earlier on, and we were at Amaren, and they've been doing amazing work on looking at their their plant stock in their vineyards and discovering a whole variety of grapes that I didn't know existed. Richard mentioned some, Cadrete, Benedicto, um, to name but two. And obviously nobody knows these. Uh, they're not, they're not going to be commercially successful. We have supermarkets like Waitrose and M&S doing their lost and found or loved and cherished or once forgotten or whatever the ranges are called. <laughs> And um, I don't think anybody is going to be rushing to put um, Cadrete into one of these ranges because it's going to have really you know, sort of no uh, uh, consumer recognition. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a frustrating thing that whenever you're talking about Spain and looking for things, you, you say, oh, well, we've got Tempranillo, we've got Garnacha. Could we use Tinto Velasco from, uh, from La Mancha? Could we bring in some Graciano? Could we do Tintia? Could we do what? Um, it is quite difficult, I think, with Spain in that the commercial direction of Spain over uh, sort of since the Spanish accession to the EU has been very much on Tempranillo and, and Garnacha. 
And so we really don't um, have enough consumer awareness of the other grape varieties. I know Torres have been um, trying to create things in Catalonia, uh, maybe with Sumoy or, or whatever grape varieties they're planning on. But these are really sort of very niche things. Um, we've got one of the panelists today, Manuel uh, in Canta La Piedra, right in the heart of, of, of Rueda growing Verdeco, not within the Appalachian, but um, he's doing something using a grape variety that is well known, but making it in a very distinctive way. And I think that's quite an interesting mm -hmm. um, way to develop this. And he will no doubt tell us a lot more about it later. So I'll sure. And also, that, I think that, thank you. Thank you, Paul. That neatly seeks perhaps to um, my next subheader is rare. And um, as, as we're on to, we're, we're going to introduce or ask Jorge Mendez to introduce himself. Um, Jorge, I'm not sure, are you, are you in Tenerife at the moment? But your, um, your, your topic is reviving forgotten Tenerife varietals. So now we're really drilling down and it'll be interesting to consider when you get to this you know sort of beloved by sommeliers by wine geeks by by sort of really good indie merchants with inquisitive indie merchants um and wine lovers um well yeah in in your own words jorge do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and um and about reviving forgotten tenery for artles and, and we're maybe with thought as to as to what that helps to give to the sort of the overall spanish offer yeah yeah so First of all, thanks, Andrew, for uh, coming here with us. And it's a pleasure for me to speak about something about Canary Island or Canary Forgotten Grey Varieties, mm -hmm. because it's some really, really interesting and some really different in compare of the rest of the world in terms of accent, absolutely accent of phylloxera place. You know? So all the grey varietals we have here, we need to know uh, that history is important to try to understand why we are making wine on the most southern region of Europe, that is practically next, next to Sahara Desert, that probably all the people think about here it's better for, have sun, go to the beach, enjoy a good uh, Christmas with sun. But then we have capacity for May wine for different simple reasons. And one of them is the, uh, the absolute the accent of phylloxera. No? So mm -hmm. we need to know like five centuries ago, uh, people that live here before colonization uh, don't practice agriculture, so they don't know nothing about to uh, grow grape vines or bananas that we have to here or whatever. Uh, so all the uh, agriculture and all the viticulture in, in terms of, of wine arrived here five centuries ago uh, in, with, during the colonization. So uh, a lot of these grape varietals that we are keeping here right now it because when phylloxera arrived to Europe disappeared and we are lucky to keep here like dinosaurs in our Jurassic Park or something like this. So that's really interesting because when we talk about old vines, here we are talking about extremely old vines. Not all the vineyards are old, obviously. And a really important part of our uh, project that is Bodegas Viñatigo, it was since a little bit more than 30 years to try to recuperate all of this heritage and all of this identity in terms of work with our local not indigenous because mm, these grapes are not come from here, uh, arrived from Europe at, at some time, but it's focusing and basing on trying to recuperate all of this weight of heritage we have here, no? And then mm -hmm. in terms of these forgotten grape vines, you can find here like, I don't know if you heard about Marmajuelo, Vijareo Blanco, Tintilla, that is not the Tintilla de Rota, it's another one, uh, and another different uh, grape varietals that are only here, it's quite an amaz amazing uh, uh, thing to try to understand, no? Because, I don't know, uh, it's really, really important to know that 30 years ago, wine growers here think about we have whites and red grape varieties, and they make uh, white wine, red wine, or a claret mix, and they don't uh, put attention in the uh, type of grape varietals, no? They, they have. Mm -hmm because they may wine for his own consumption and just for try to survive or, or, or something. So uh, our project was one of these first one that tried to uh, start to investigate and try to know something more about the great varieties that we have here. It's something similar like Torres, like Paul Cheney's uh, talk about. 
it's made in, in, in Catalonia with a small, for example, we have small two here and we call it Bijariego Negro. Uh, so it's really, really interesting to talk about all of this because these forgotten grapes was forgotten just not only in Tenerife, was forgotten in Europe in general or just in the world. And the difference between uh, Canary Island and, and the rest of the world is we are lucky to have here all of these different, absolutely different grape varietals. And we are not talking about uh, Syrah in Australia. We are not talking about Cabernet Sauvignon in Maipo. We are talking about Marmajuelo in Tenerife. That's <laughs> quite interesting and, and, and different, no? So that's, I think that's the real key and real important way to uh, analyze and understand Tenerife forgotten grape vines, I think, no? Yeah, and a question for you then, Jorge. Um, I mean, considering maybe like Tenerife as the the sort of I sort of microcosm of of, of the, the, the the macro picture that is Spain. I mean, how 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 much more across Spain and its islands, its territories can? Uh, I mean, how much further can it mine indigenous varieties? That there, there are an awful lot that effectively, outside of a tiny percentage of wine lovers, are are, are still unknown, right? I mean, there's a lot more that could be revived, that could be revived. Moment, yeah. At this moment, uh, we identify exactly 82 different grape varieties. Yeah. Uh, practically 50% of these grape varieties are only exist right now in Canary Islands. What does mean that disappear in all over the world because of phylloxera. Mm -hmm. And the 50% rest are exist in other places. So we know the procedence because of them. No? For example, the most extended one here is Listan Blanco. That is the same as Palomino, you know. Uh, we have another ones, but then because of this, uh, and, and you talk about mutations and all of this, uh, so because of these mutations here are uh, a lot, so it's it's quite a problem for us. Uh, and natural cross are mm, like natural process, absolutely, no? So here we, you can find a lot of different grape varietals like Listan Negro, that it's a natural cross between uh, Listan Blanco and Negramol, or you can find uh, the Malvasia, typical Malvasia from Lanzarote, that it's a cross between the real Malvasia that come from Sitges, Italy, Croatia, mixed with uh, the Marmajuelo that right now is only exists here. So try to speak about all of this cross, uh, natural cross or whatever. It's quite amazing and quite big uh, conversation to try to understand the weight of all of these great varieties we have here. No? Well, I think it just adds so much to um, <clears throat> the overall excitement around Spain, and and perhaps to say it's more at a sommelier, independent merchant level. But it's 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 you know where we can have sort of explained and hand sold. Excellent, thank you, Jorge. Um, right, so where do we go from rare? Well, I'd like to go on to um, topic of evolution and um, Manuel Man Manuel um, Cantala Piedra. Um, who is, um, I believe you're going to fill us in a little bit on breaking the mold of the classic Dio style. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up over to you, Mamal, to explain, explain what we mean by that and, and, um, and to introduce yourself and also your, your, your winery would be great. So uh, yeah, far away. Okay. Hi, hi all. Um, thanks for, for the invitation and I'm happy to to, to share this time with you. Uh, sorry, I was a bit late. Uh, I, I had um, I had a child uh, eight months ago, uh, so it's, <laughs> life is a bit more complicated now. Uh, well, um, I want to talk uh, about um, about Verdejo mainly uh, about uh, the possibilities of Verdejo because uh, when we when we talk about uh, about breaking the mold. Um, I think we talk about this because uh, there is like a, a standard for Verdejo. Verdejo is, uh, for me, it's a variety that is not known. The real Verdejo is not known. Uh, um, Rueda uh, started to produce uh, these uh, modern white wines in the 80s. Uh, well, the 80s started the, uh, the appellation. It wasn't. It was not the, the traditional uh, wine from Rueda because in Rueda uh, we produced uh, Rancio, uh, Rancio uh, Vino, Vino Rancio, Rancio, 
which uh, is uh, called Dorado here in, in Rueda. And, and, and there were much more Palomino than Verdejo planted, in fact. Uh, the, 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 the blend was Verdejo, but with a lot of Palomino. And, and the wine was uh, fortified, uh, so it was a completely different uh, style. But when they started to produce uh, these uh, modern whites, I think um, they they don't the population or the producers back in the day in, at that, that time. I think they they look to other countries uh, instead of uh, trying to find an, uh, um, uh, their, their own style. They 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 try to 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 see which wines uh, were uh, selling well in the world and they look to sauvignon blanc a lot so they started to produce something really similar to to sauvignon blanc but uh, with bedejo in fact we have a lot of sauvignon blanc uh, planted also which uh, i think is, it's it's a mistake for me but uh, anyway, uh, when we started in 2014, uh, we started in the appellation, um, but I wanted to, to, to produce a completely different style of wine because uh, I, I, I knew some producers that were making a different kind of verdejo, like a more natural verdejo without yeast, uh, all spontaneous fermentation, uh, low sulfur levels, um, and some 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 kind of uh, more artisan way to produce verdejo, and when when you when you try our wines, uh, I think nobody thinks is it, it's verdejo, and that's a that's a saying because um, our wines uh, probably are the more honest, the, the most honest uh, uh, verdejos you can find in, in the market right now because uh, they just have. But it, it was really, really hard at the beginning. The, the, the wines were, they didn't pass the, the, the tastings of the appellation. The, the, the wine was uh, uh, sold as Vino de la Tierra de Castilla y León. Um, and we, we left the winery, uh, the, the appellation in 2015 or 2016, I think two years after, two years after we started. Uh, we didn't. We 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 have not sell, sold uh, any 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 wine under the appellation in in those two years because the wines were uh, were not accepted uh, as good, and that's uh, and that's for me that's the the big issue. These tastings uh, in the in the appellation for me are not uh, are useless. I think uh, the market will tell you if your wine is good enough or not good enough. What uh, an appellation has to do is to control the origin of, of the grapes, that you are not getting more grapes than you, you, you can from, uh, from, from the gills. I mean, uh, they, they should control the origin, the gills. But uh, I think anyone could make uh, the wine uh, that, that, that they want to, to, to produce. And if, if, if you can sell the, the, that wine to, to a client, why anybody tell, tells you or, or can tell you that that's not uh, what you can sell? I mean, it's like, for me, it's nonsense. Uh, because uh, uh, if, for example, uh, Rueda were like uh, Jura, Jura in France, uh, um, uh, the opposite. I mean, if if Juba were, were like Rueda, uh, Ganevat or Auvergnat or um, Labette wouldn't be selling their wines, and probably they are the best, or or at least the the, the best known uh, producers uh, from Jura in the world. So uh, it's uh, it's uh, something that that is changing a bit now in Rueda because they finally. Um, they they saw that there was a, another another path, uh, and they are trying to 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 find a way. But um, I think it's, it's quite far, quite far to 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 reach this uh, this this this. Um, and I don't know. Sorry, I I, I cannot I can say um, I cannot explain. 
uh, my, sorry for my English. Uh, um, anyway, um, there are not so many producers doing uh, doing different kind of verdejo. Um, and most of them, if not all, are out of the appellation. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's true that the appellation uh, is trying to, to change things. But on the other hand, uh, right now, if I put Rueda in my label, it would be bad for me. And this, this is something that is very, 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 very bad. I mean, they, they should think about this because if I put Rueda uh, right, right now in my label, uh, a lot of sommeliers uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't like that, 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 that change. Because uh, the problem with Red Eye is that uh, they they have been focusing in cheap and, and yeah. low to medium quality maybe wines that uh, that um, is not a good image image right now uh, the the, the, the Red Eye um, appellation uh, is not something that people. Um, um, relate to quality. Um, so um, we are uh, maybe four or five producers that are producing uh, a different kind of uh, verdejo, like uh, Ismael Gozalo, uh, Esmeralda Garcia, uh, Barco del Corneta, um, and I think uh, me. There are uh, three, four producers that are producing uh, quality verdejo, uh, high quality verdejo, uh, but in the in the in the in the I mean in the in the original uh, or, or the traditional way, but still still really 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 far to 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 reach this um, to change the the the, the region. Uh, it's a kind of uh, mm. uh, I think it's a starting, but but it's uh, really far yet. Yeah, so I think as you say, there are there are moves afoot. And interesting enough, I was um I was hosting a um discussion about Rueda yesterday and, and it, it involved this and some of the producers yourselves that have stepped outside um so I mean I, I guess just a is it a question to you or just an observation um Manuel I, that that whereas the the DOs ha do have do have some very useful functions um and obviously perhaps earlier in the evolution of regions um they they were there to kind of protect quality and image and, and to generically promote what we're really saying is perhaps there could be a little bit more flexibility and they have to look at the potential for, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the terroir, the grape in the ground, um, what the producers can achieve either from being hands on or hands off. Um, so, so in essence, you're, you're saying that, that more flexibility um, should be allowed to, to encourage some of the best wines to come out of, of not just Rueda, but, but various DOs, I guess. Yes. Yes. I mean, uh, for me, creativity is what gives uh, the, yeah. the best wines in the world. Uh, if you cut that and you don't let the producer to be creative, uh, creative, uh, you're you're losing uh, a lot of uh, different kind of uh, wines because uh, I think uh, the other problem we have here is th there is no uh, there is no the producer style. I mean, all the wines look the same, taste the same, and that's the, the same problem. I mean, it, it's all all the same problem. Uh, um, we you don't you don't have variety of of, of styles. Of uh, you cannot uh, recognize a producer. I mean, I cannot imagine uh, bl making a blind tasting of verdejos and trying to uh, to 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 guess the producer because. Most of the wines are made uh, are made uh, with uh, with a French yeast. Uh, no, no, so no, so many uh, are, are producing uh, the wines uh, with uh, autochthonous yeast or spontaneous fermentation, and 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 even even for example the cooperative Cuatro Rayas, which is the biggest uh, winery in 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 Rueda. Is trying now. They are they are making Roberto, which is uh, one of the yeah. winemakers, is doing a great job, and he's making uh, uh, some interesting wines uh, 
from the, the, the old wines because you have to you have to think that uh, Cuatro Rayas ha, have the, the, the best vineyards in Rueda because they are the biggest and they have a lot of actors and a lot of uh, uh, Pie Franco uh, vines and and they are making a great job and they are having they are having problems they are getting problems with the appellation to get the stem in the bottle because the, mm -hmm. the, the wines that don't, don't pass don't pass the the tastings uh, so yeah. they okay. they tell you that uh, they are changing but um, they well, are not, not, not changing, changing that, fast, that much fast, not that fast. much okay okay well yeah. uh, okay all right well look thank you very much for those um those insights it would be, um, be fantastic if we could have a, a you know a wine or wines from each of you to try as well to really help prove the points that we're uh we're we're, we're talking about so um but um manuel thanks and uh hopefully we'll have a little time left for some general discussion anyway which bring everyone in, in in a moment um but aware of time running and um uh last to speak among our panelists but very very far from least um on the topic of the hot topic of sustainability uh, we have Vicky Gonzalez Gordon from Gonzalez Bias, um, and Vicky, I believe you're going to talk about the benefits um, from vineyard to glass uh, in terms of sustainability. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, well, I'll explain a little bit of our company to understand so that everyone can understand how it is today and how we are applying sustainability. Okay, well, Gonzalez Bias was founded in Jerez de la Frontera, 1835. We are still a family-owned company now in fifth generation. Um, for the first 140 years of the company, it was dedicated exclusively to sherry wines and brandies. From the 1980s, expansion began always <clears throat> in the wine and spirits sector to other regions, first in Spain and then in, in Chile and, and Mexico as well. So today we have uh, wine, wineries in 12 different um, regions across Spain, Chile and Mexico. We have a strong sustainability um, program. Sustainability has always been part of, of the company and, uh, and one of our values from our founder. Our program was implemented 10 years ago and it's called Five Plus Five Caring for the Planet. It's representing five generations of the family that have led the company um, being sustainable or caring for the planet to the 21st century so that the next five generations can continue this mission. So we talk about this long-term vision in our, in our program, which is of course very close to sustainability. And it, it implies all our processes from what we do in the vineyard to what we do in the, in the winery and in bottle. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, as I um, was explaining, we have different wineries, different regions, well, as other of our colleagues that we were explaining previously. Of course, each has its own challenges. I mean, vineyard can, doesn't have the same <clears throat> situation in Rias Baixas than in Rueda, or we cannot implement clean energies the same way or as easily in a new winery as we have done in Rioja than, for example, here where I am in Jerez, where, where we have a um, 19th um, century historical building. So each winery has its, its challenges, let's say. In each of them, we have um, they all have their own sustainability program with uh, water programs, eco-efficiency plans, biodiversity plans. Each of them concentrates in specific issues depending on, on where we are. Well, we have um, independent winemaking team in each of them, which is uh, good because each of them can lead in different aspects and can share knowledge, which is also very, very important. Something that is uh, relevant in, in sustainability is that it needs to be part of the strategy of the company um, from the beginning and implemented across the whole process. So this is something that needs to be embedded in the company, not something that happens afterwards. So um, a second thing that is also very relevant is to measure. We need to, to measure everything to see where you can improve. You need to measure your emissions. You need to measure where they are coming from so you can work there. You can need to measure the water you use. You need to measure all your processes because it's the only way to, to improve no? and, to, and to be sustainable. <clears throat> and knowing your reality will establish objectives that are doable, but that are um, ambitious, let's say, and specific plans no? for each of them. Um, something that we do is we work with a continuous improvement philosophy. So, 
um, taking in mind that every little step counts and that everything is important. Like we are on a journey. We, we cannot do everything at the same time. I mean, I think we have all gone now or over this um, greenwashing that there was so much talking about because I mean, I think everyone is well aware that we need to reach some objectives and we are on our way. No? So this is, this is also important. And well, obviously we need to be um, sustainable because we need to survive. No, we are, we, we are an agricultural product. Um, we rely on nature. We have been, um, Richard was talking before about the hard uh, harvests we have had. No, we cannot change our locations but we can plant new, new new plants in other places, but I mean, we are linked to, to, to the region, so we need to adapt a lot of our adaptation. Well, we know consumers are more and more aware. We know retailers and trade are more and more pushing. Legislation is also uh, pushing quite hard, but in the end, we have our responsibility. No, we need to be, to be sustainable. We need to act. But as you were saying, Andrew, we need to take benefit out of this in the end. Um, um, economic sustainability is also part of the equation. So we, with sustainability uh, advantages or benefits we have, well, we gain efficiency um, with less consumption of energy, less consumption of, of water, well, we reach better costs. We comply with future generations. We have healthier soils. So th there are benefits in, in every step no, that, that we, that we uh, look at. So if, if you go to the vineyard, as I was saying, you have um, uh, healthier soils, which is obviously good for the, for the wines. If, if you move to clean energies in the wineries or save water or be more efficient, well, you also have better costs over there. And also a part that is very relevant for, for wineries and, and also for us is all the um, emissions we have in scope three. So, basically well a high percentage of it comes from packaging so this is something we also need to look at very carefully so we are auditing our, all our packagings um, we are implementing eco design um, processes so trying to to look at the whole at the whole process of, of winemaking not, not only in the vineyard but um, as a, at, at the whole business let's say you're muted andrew there we go. Thank you. Um, I had some background noise, so I thought I'd uh, I just just shunt that out for a bit. But um, yeah, no, absolutely in, in, incredibly important. Um, and I think Spain is is sort of well placed to could to continue to you know take a strong lead on 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 this. Um, uh, so question to uh, Hannah, could we we pick up with you and and, and forgive me, I haven't had a, a word in Edrays yet, but which is unlike you. But um, um, sustainability, how how important. Um, how receptive is the UK, the UK customer, your customer, the consumer, to, to messages of sustainability? Um, I, I'd like to hear, I'm honest, um, because we're getting more and more, more customers asking about sustainability, um, and not just down to the vineyard, but uh, packaged in, uh, the use of corks, um, uh, they're very anti-plastic corks like that, and you know, um, it's it's very interesting. Uh, we There's one winery we work with who uh, everything on their bottle is fully recycled, um, so um, from label to the cork that's used to the to the strap that goes over the top, it's all fully recyclable. Um, the narrative of de has definitely grown and uh, just the light, you know, with it. Um, it's part of our dialogue as, as wine shop owners and workers, it's part of our dialogue when we meet wine producers, um, spirit producers, um, we want to know um, about sustainability. So it's natural now that customers are um, are really, really asking us as well, which, and it doesn't seem like it's a rarity anymore. So from our point of view, it, it's an open dialogue and it's one we need to be having. Um, and, and in the wine trade, it is true. So climate change, we talk about, uh, you know, and it's very much a daily headline. Um, and sustainability will only continue to grow. So it's, it's a positive. 
So, and do you think Spain is in any way particularly well placed to 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 present its sustainable credentials over any other rival countries? Or um, I, I I do, but I'm I'm old world style than new world. Nothing against new world, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I I think Spain. I, I, listen, the. It's not just about organic wine. The organic wines that are coming out of Spain, um, the more interesting grape varietals that come out of Spain. Um, it, it is, for me, it's the old world doing what it does best. And I think Spain is in a particularly good place right now. Um, and I put my head up last year and everybody said to me, What's, what do you think is going to be good? Yeah. And I said, Spain and Portugal have got it absolutely licked. And I really do mean it this year. I think 23 is the year for Spain and Portugal. And I'm delighted. So, you know. Yeah, and I think that ties in nicely with um, some of the the, uh, the the topics that we've heard about. So whether it's sort of championing old vines or uh, and that sort of ties in with indigenous varieties and diversity. Um, and you know, then then down to sort of almost like a, a, a microcosm in the Canaries and Tenerife as well. So, so I think I think those are at a, at a certain level really strong messages that that, that 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 are coming out of Spain and Spain can push. Okay, um, I'm aware of time running, and I wanted to um, just a couple of questions more broadly to the panel. And one ties in quite nicely with a question from audience question from Kenneth Rupa. Um, hi there, um, who says philosophical question: Should the role of the DO be innovative and creative, or is it meant to protect? The majority of the members who may be more conservative in their views and 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 the question of mine i had um which was um related was kind of how how far should i mean being respectful of the importance of st style defining dos how how do they strike without getting to a massive political argument here and upsetting half of spain um where where should the balance be and and obviously we've you know manuel we've 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 heard from you and really take on board your points about flexibility creativity was the word i think you you landed on especially um and if you throttle that in winemakers and winemaking then you know you you lose some of the excitement and potential but does anyone else want to pick up on that with a with a view um so victor are you looking looking keen to speak there I, I would definitely reinforce what Manuel said. I think I think the appellations, the concept of a of a board of people at a consejo regulador deciding what is allowed to be called a certain appellation's wines by an arbitrary taste test to me is totally ludicrous and wrong. Um, I think I think oftentimes many of Spain's most important and significant appellations, you know, Rueda is one of them. You could look at Rioja for sure in the same way are dominated by, by the large producers who pay and fund the appellation in other ways, but also through the back label stickers that everyone has to pay for. So if you're a producer that, that purchases four or five million back label stickers a year, then that's significant. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think that the DO, like Manuel said, should be there to control um, yield, should be there to make sure that bulk wine isn't brought in and out of the appellation, uh, which is, I think, a problem that, you know, can exist in some parts of Spain, uh, should should be there to control um, uh, vintages, uh, stuff like that, but al allow producers create creativity to produce quality wines and to push these regions forward. I mean, you know, we have a tremendously rich viticultural heritage and winemaking heritage, but I think it's really important that, that, um, that the country is allowed to kind of Flex its creative muscles and, and and improve the quality of wines that it makes and and it you know it might it's not a straight line right there will be kind of curves along the journey and 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 dead ends too that you know we'll have to kind of turn around and 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 forge forward but I definitely think that in some cases the DOs are are too, are too controlling and I think uh, prevent a lot of the quality minded producers from 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 flexing their muscles so. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Um, just to pull in another another question from the audience, actually, um, Pip Pip Vanham. Hi, Pip. Thank you. Um, who asked? Will newly? I was wondering this as we went along, and maybe I'll direct this up to you, Richard. Up in the sense that you're top left in my screen. Will newly planted grafted vines be able to function as a hundred plus year old ungrafted vines? um do in 40 to 50 plus year time so 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 basically will the new vines of today work in the same way when they are the old wines of tomorrow as the old vines of today i think that's the sense of the question 
Um, right. Uh, I'm not a viticulturist, um, but sort of logic says that if you're grafting onto a, an old vine, you are benefiting um, from many things. So um, a new grafting onto an old vine will give you many of the benefits of the, the original old vine. Um, I, I think the issue here is, is about protecting old vine, giving it its space, giving it this extra added value. And when new plantings are made, and of course new plantings are made, um, choose locations that are going to give low yield rather than high yield um, uh, let's say it's it, these are all quality parameters that if we follow them will be beneficial for the total industry that we're so uh, fond of and proud of and, and earn our earn our livings from um, yeah yeah I hope that answers the question um, I'm not a viticulturist but obviously grafting onto an old vine, you'll get the benefits, most of the benefits of the old vine. Um, of course, there comes a point when they are too old and, and, and there are some negatives, um, you know, they don't go on forever. Uh, sure. and yeah. 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 Okay, would anyone else like to chip in there? Um, Vicky, perhaps, or anyone? Yeah, I tend to, to agree no, with, um, with, with Richard. Um, the new vines of today be the vines of the, um, the, the old vines of the future. Well, hopefully, no. Hopefully, this is what we need to 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 hope and to work on because um, otherwise, what will be the wine of the future? The old vines will disappear. No, if this is not the if this is not the case. So yeah, if they survive, they will be the old vines of the of the future, of course. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um... Right, just go time for a couple more questions to the panel, I think. Um, now, they, they, we, we, we've obviously delved into indigenous old and rare varieties, which are truly exciting for, um, you know, for the trade, for wine lovers, wine geeks, if you like, um, sommeliers to get to grips with and so on. Um, in terms of, in terms, will, will they remain necessarily niche, though? Will, will you know, um, is, is it sort of like a bit of a part of the, the sort of halo effect in the crown of the Spain? Um, and we talked about the big hitters like Tempranillo and Garnacha as well, which are fantastically are indigenous. That's great. So there's a real indigenous identity right from the get go. Um, but will will many of the exciting discoveries that I see when I go to the wines from Spain tasting, when I go along and look at especially the specialist uh, uh, importers portfolios, the, the ones that everyone's getting really excited about, there's always a crowd around the table with sort of funky producers and their funky little patches of vines, you know, um, Will it, will they necessarily remain niche, or could could Spain? I mean, I don't know. Hannah, as a, as a merchant, what 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 do you think? How how important, realistically, commercially to Spain as a whole, are some of these indigenous niche and indigenous varieties? Um, it takes me back to wine support. Um, niche uh, grape varietals are amazing. Um, it doesn't take long for for mass, I'm going to use the word, mass producers to jump on the bandwagon though. Um, and I always think back years ago to things like Malbec's, Argentinian Malbec's and how Argento became human overnight. And I remember selling the first bottles came into the UK. And I think that Spain needs to protect itself um, and not allow it to become a mass market commodity because um you know i think that's the interesting part and that's the reason why i love talking about the great varietals and uh, touching on earlier on somebody said you know garnacha and the french expression and i totally get it it is they are different in styles and it should celebrate both styles should be celebrated in their own right and so um, the produced and the kind of uninteresting variety, you know, it's called the varietals, really, really upset the apple cart, I'd say. Um, because I don't think there's anything wrong with paying for a, an amazing product. I think the consumer's paying for an amazing product, but you just don't want it to get watered down, is what I would probably say. So, take it, guys. <laughs> Yep, no, fair enough. Uh, does there, would anyone else, and I'll begin to, I think we'll begin to sort of wrap up and, and, and look towards sort of summary here. But does anyone else want to quickly comment on that? If, we, if, I, if I might say, yes, Paul. You know, Albarino, um, mm. if we go back to um, 
the late 80s or early 90s, Albarino was an unheard of grape variety over here. And it was only what success during the middle 90s that people started to get to know Albarino and now look at it. Yeah. So um, unknown grape varieties can definitely um, gain mass acceptance, but they have to be commercially relevant. And in and that flavor, that style has to be relevant. So try, I mean, let's pick on Moravia from La Mancha or somewhere. Oh, that's quite a challenging style, I think, at the moment. So until you find a way to make it um, acceptable stylistically, it's probably still going to remain pretty niche. There will be some people who are keen on it, but it will be fairly mm. small scale, I reckon. And I suppose there's always an element you can't quite tell either, can you? I mean, I was... I was living in the People's Republic of Islington where the, the gastro pub and the, the eagle landed and the gastro pub revolution seemed to seem to be a bit of a nucleus. And I remember Al Barino started to appear on um, on it, it almost became a mandatory must list to show how cool an individual you were. And once it sort of got a foothold there, it sort of spread like wildfire. So it was just extraordinary to watch that um, that variety. And and as you say, look at look at where we are now. So, um, OK, well, look, um, we've covered a lot of ground and uh, some really great points we made. We've had. Um, some nice comments back from from the audience as well. Um, so I, th I think really just to sort of generally sum sum up, um, if I could just invite, unless anyone's got a burning point they really want to make, but I guess you you could use this to do it. it. Just just to sort of sum up and ask the simple question again to the panel, but maybe really briefly in a sort of sentence or two. Um, looking ahead, what are the key trends and innovations that will continue to carry Spain forward? on its, um, what I see as an exciting upward trajectory. It's already been on an exciting upward trajectory for, for, for you know, quite a while, but it, it shows no sign of slowing down. So I don't know, just go around the around the panel, if that's okay. Um, Richard, what, what for you would be, if you just had to encapsulate something looking to the future, it doesn't have to be the topic that you've spoken on, but mm. what, what for you is most yep. important? Mm. Uh, for me, it's clear. We need to focus on quality instead of quantity. Yep. We need to talk about diversity instead of uni grape type. And in my humble opinion, we need to make the most of some of our real strengths, such as old vine, uh, that at the same time are part of a much bigger conversation with our consumer, which is protecting the world and, and protecting the future. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Vicky, what would, uh, what would your thoughts be? Same question. Yeah, I think Spain needs to um, continue to move towards quality and always uh, maintain um, its being respectful and sustainable yeah, for the future. Yeah, excellent. Um, so we'll run through run through our Spanish contingent first. Uh, Jorge, what what thoughts from you? Yeah, what I what I think it's what Vicky say about uh, speak about uh, treat well the soils because probably uh, we forget the soils during 50, 60, 70 years using a lot of pesticides, herbicides, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's important to grow something, to grow an identity, and to start to be sustainable from the first place that it's the agriculture and it's the vineyard. And then it's important for me too to have focus and to have the brain, to have the head always on, like Manuel uh, Cantalapiedra talks about, uh, you need to have an identity, you need to make yourself, you need to create, uh, you need to believe on what you are making because you are defending uh, a style on the ones you are making. And I think that's important too. So if you have focus on all of this and if you put value on the gray varietals you have on your place, uh, the places you are, and then at all, it's like, trying to humanize the products we are making. It's simple to say, but nowadays wine is not about wine, it's about more. No, it's about, we are talking about history, we are talking about identity, we are talking about culture, and we are talking about, we need to treat well all around us. So that's my perception about the future. Sustainable is, is totally important, but identity in general is important. Yeah, and they're all they're all interlinked. And I, I love the way you put that because when I look into a glass of wine, it's not just the wine. There, there's so many different facets that surround it. It's it's fantastic, but obviously protecting protecting uh, agricultural produce, so protecting um, the, the 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 soils and land it comes from. Um, Manuel, anything to to add to that? Well, um, I would say the same. Um, quality is quality, 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 and quality. I think it's. 
it's is the the biggest uh, the most important thing and i also think uh, we need to be more uh, uh, we need to learn much more one of the problems i i see in, in some regions is that the winemakers don't know uh, a lot of the, of, uh, the best of the greatest uh, wines uh, in the world and if you want to make a great wine or a good wine you have to try a lot of wine you cannot i think for me it's not possible to to make a great wine if you don't know the great the great wines of the world and it's something that every every winemaker uh, or vigneron or uh, should should uh, should do uh, to to learn to learn about uh, the, the the wine world the 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 the, the best uh, countries, the best regions, the best populations uh, uh, of the world, and and that's a way to to find your your own your own path to because uh, we we need to as as Jorge said, uh, yeah. identity is really important. We cannot change our style every twenty years uh, mm -hmm. following uh, the, the the fashion or, or the style of the wine that the the consumers. Uh, uh, want at that at that moment we need a consist consistency uh, and uh, an identity as as Jorge said yeah. and also one one last thing I I really think that we need uh, a lot of wine uh, uh, in a, in a price because uh, I'm seeing a, a a problem in Spain for me it's a problem and we come from the cheapest wines and now we have more and more producers that have this kind of 300 euros bottle or 400 euros uh, wine. For me, uh, what we need is something in the middle, a really strong uh, um, um, middle um, uh, price that uh, of, of uh, quality wines, uh, not mm -hmm. not going from, from zero to 200, uh, yeah. but uh, having something really strong and, and in the middle. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. Um, so very quickly now, because I'm aware that I've, I've, we, we've, we've overrun quite a bit. But Victor, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a line or two, is there, is there anything left to say? We, we, uh, we all aligned. I don't, I don't know that there's much left, much yeah. left to say. I think it's, um, it's focusing on, not just indigenous varieties, but what we like to call traditional viticulture. I mean, there's a buzzword for everything these days, and and that's ours. It's, it's. Yeah. farming vineyards the way that vineyards were farmed for many years obviously not with the pesticides and herbicides and uh, systemic fertilizers that we used for much of the 60s 70s and 80s but doing things the old-fashioned way and producing wines of, of quality and distinction and um, I think I want to reinforce Manuel's point because that's what I was going to say is um, it's important to have an, uh, an international perspective with regard to the great wines of the world because I think that's something that certainly has been lacking that that is changing but um, over the last decades, that's something that, um, you know, learning to appreciate the culture of fine wine that exists around the world and applying that to indigenous varieties, old vineyards and and traditional viticulture. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. And 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 can we just do a, a, a quick word? I, I don't want to leave the, the UK panelists out. So um, Hannah, in a word, what what what's the biggest thing that strikes you um, going Honestly, forward? We've got the easy job. We find the wines. We don't make them. <laughs> yes, fair uh, but all I will ever say, all all I will ever say is let's find them, work together, and let's get them in front, and let's get the samples going in front of customers. And I tell you what, as soon as the consumers have tried, they love them. So yeah. it's that simple. So back to uh, I don't know if it's an awful expression, but li li liquid on lips. Um, and Paul, final word to um to to, to your good self. Um, what I particularly enjoy in the way and the confidence that I have in the future is that I see that as uh, newer generations have built on the sterling work that their predecessors have done since really uh, Spain uh, joined the, the Europe in 86, is that they are finding their confidence and they're finding their confidence to try and define wines from their origin with their grapes and their flavors. And perhaps if, uh, to slightly corny to say that they've got the confidence to walk naked in the street. They don't need to rely on that old traditional Spanish flavor of oak and vanilla 
and to deliver us wines which are distinctive. They might be fresh and they might be vibrant. They might not be what the UK consumer has typically traditionally enjoyed, but they're leading us into a very much more exciting path. Witness Manuel with his amazing wines from La Seca. Witness John Cañas in Amarem making some extraordinary Riochas. Mm -hmm. Wines without oak, white, uh, tasting some white wine without any oak. Um, this is brave for somebody from Rioja. <laughs> And I, so I'm, I think that the future is very rosy because there are a lot of very good people out there doing really following their own um, region with pride. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really apparent, isn't it? It's such, such an exciting country. Um, so much going on. So I know we've touched on some of it. Every country has its ups and its downs, its positives and minuses. But I think I think and I'm sure everyone tuned, tuned in. Um, probably feels the same about Spain. So on that very positive note, I'd like to thank you very, very much, all of you, for all of your time and input. Um, we've had some lovely comments back from the audience about how many great points we made and how interesting the session's been, so that's good. There'll be others. We've had a good attendance as well. There'll be others who um, I know will be picking up with the recording. So um, thank you, Foods and Wines from Spain. It's happened, and um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you all. So hopefully meet you in person soon over a, over a glass of wine. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye for now. Bye.